Welcome to the Jamie Glazoff Show. Our guest this evening, Leon Weinstein, Soviet emigre, expert on totalitarianism, and the author of the new book, Capitalism 101. We're going to be covering quite a few themes and topics with our very special guest this evening. We're going to begin with tears for Kim Jong-il. But, and we're also going to be discussing Leon Weinstein's new book, Capitalism 101. Are you there, Leon? And I'm very glad to be here and honored. Thank you. There, Leon, let us begin with Hi. tears for Kim Jong-il. We see on the TV screen now, we see some of the videos, uh, Leon, North Koreans crying in great grief. Now, my mother has told uh, a story uh, to me, and you know, she's told me very sto- many stories, but when Stalin died, she was crying bitterly. Her mother was crying. I mean, it was almost the end of the world, the end of, you know, God had died. Um, but at the same time, there's also great fear and trepidation. In, in terms of you being from the Soviet Union and knowing something about this totalitarian mindset, can you give us a little bit of the psychology of what's going on there? Uh, I will try to. Um, actually, I was born, uh, you know, like six or seven years before Stalin died, so when he died, it didn't impact me personally. But I also heard those stories, and my aunt told me that she cried like like baby, and, I, and she's a very perceptive person. So I began to ask her questions at a certain point. And she said, you know, uh, I, I, I cried not because I loved Stalin very much, not because I loved communism very much, but because we were so much dependent on the state. Everything that we were doing was either, you know, prohibited or allowed or, or, or given to us by the state. So the state, and the, usually when you have a tyranny, the state uh, has a personification, and this is the person who is in charge of the pyramid. In our case, it was Stalin. Here it was King Jong Il, uh, the second, I believe, and uh, uh, that's why people people are scared. They're scared to the future. They don't know what will happen. They they as exactly like you mentioned, it's uh, like God died because communism or or uh, you know develop well developed socialism as they call it is is uh, a religion. They build it as a religion with apostles, with with Messiah, their own Messiah. They exchange God for something else, like like uh, sometimes uh, Karl Marx, sometimes uh, Lenin, Stalin, or somebody somebody like that. So when people, uh, when somebody like Kim Jong Il dies, it's like like uh, uh, an earthquake for people. They don't know what will happen. So they're scared, and mainly that's why they're crying. Leon, um, I don't want to pry too much into your age, which would be impolite, but in terms of your Soviet experience, uh, in terms of Stalin's death, do you know some stories, some anecdotes about when that secular despot died in terms of your own experience and family? Uh, Maybe not with the death, but, you know, uh, everything was depending on Stalin, everything was depending on the ruling party and the regime, so practically everything that happened to my family prior to my birth and and during um, the time that I was a little child was was dictated or somehow connected to the regime and to to Stalin. Uh, Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, my parents, uh, my father uh, came from World War II. He was a paratrooper and uh, you know, received a lot of medals and, and so on and so on. Went to study at, at, to the St. Petersburg at that time, Leningrad Medical School. Uh, he knew my mom before he went to, to the front. So they decided to marry. And uh, their parents said, uh, we would like you guys to go to a synagogue. But my father said, I will be thrown out of the university, and my mom the same. So they had to do it at night, uh, because if someone would know that they uh, married each other, you know, by the religious ceremony, in this particular case it was a synagogue, but, you know, church, same thing, was prosecuted exactly like that, uh, they would be probably blacklisted for life. that's that's number one, you know, for people to know that when socialism is in full blown, usually it tries to uh, push out all other religions because, as I said already, it is a religion. Right, yeah. and it, and and the and the Soviet party, the Communist Party, wants to be the secular deity on earth, the God on earth. So that's why religion 
is almost always a legalized in communist regimes, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the second story that I can tell is uh, my grandfather... But wait, wait, before you move on, yeah. did they go get married in the synagogue? Yeah, they did at night. Right, but it was it was very scary. They they did they keep it a secret? Uh, actually, what happened is they went to a municipality, you know, got married the regular Soviet way. Um, all the guests went uh, to celebrate to a restaurant at the home. I don't remember where it was, and my parents sneaked away, like to go and have photographs. And they went together with the uh, boss, you know, fathers. Mothers didn't go. And they went from the back door of the only synagogue open in the city where five million people lived and about, you know, half a million of them Jews. One synagogue was allowed to show to the Westerners that, oh, we have a freedom of religion. Here is the synagogue. Right, so right, right. Back door and got married very quickly and came back and no one knew uh, that they married also, you know, religious ceremony. I see. Um, Leon, uh, just to get a little bit of your background, because it, it's fascinating and also important for the discussion we're going to have. Um, so would, you, would, would it be correct to say that you were raised in an anti-Soviet, anti-communist home? Uh, I probably was a very rare exception. Uh, because of my grandfather, uh, everybody else was afraid to open their mouths and say something because a young, you know, young boy, young child, uh, small child, can go and blurt whatever he heard at home, and probably, uh, you know, his parents would be, would be uh, uh, again put in prison, executed, whatever it is. We have stories like that you know, in the Soviet Union all over. So uh, people were afraid to speak in front of their children, so children grew in, in total ignorance of what really communism is all about. But my grandfather, you know, bless his heart, he died when I was seven years old, uh, he, uh, he talked. And I knew since age six that whatever he tells me, I cannot repeat at school. And at the same time, I knew that whatever I was told at kindergarten at school, he doesn't like to hear. Yeah, what kind of things was he saying? That, like, Lenin was bad, Stalin, uh, Stalin was bad, communism was bad? What uh, was he saying? I, I, no, he wasn't saying, you know, kind of direct things, Stalin bad or whatever bad, communism bad, etc. He was giving me stories. Like, uh, he was a descendant of a long line of, of Jewish rabbis. He was um, an attorney and, and a very well-known one, and mm. uh, he died because of that a little bit later. But at that time, he was telling me all kinds of stories to generate my interest and curiosity and to, to, to teach me how to not to follow but to examine things. Right, right, right. You know, you know, he tries to push me into the direction of self kind of learning. And to be a free thinker in a totalitarian culture and, and society. Uh, Leon, did you get your hands on any forbidden books? Like, for instance, as you grew older, um, you know, for instance, you know, the Gulag Archipelago or, you know, when, when the 20th Party Congress occurred, when Khrushchev finally denounced Stalin in 1956. Was that a landmark watershed for you? Do you remember being shocked at that time? Uh, yes and no. I still was too small. I am 62. I was born right. in 1949. So yeah. uh, I, uh, I was growing. I was understanding things. I was examining things, uh, you know, shutting my mouth, trying not to talk, as, mm -hmm. was, as my grand told, grandfather told me. But I think I came into age where I began to understand things, Somewhere at at uh, the age of maybe nineteen twenty something like that, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, you know end of sixties. Well, when yeah. you look back now, when we look back at the Soviet era, who who has a lot of your respect in Solzhenitsyn in terms of who led the fight for freedom in, in Russia? You know, there were the Vladimir Bukovskys, uh, the Solzhenitsyn, you know, Varlam. Shalamov, who wrote the Column of Tales, like different authors, different dissidents. What are some of your thoughts on that? You know, all of the above, uh, but uh, and I didn't know them personally. I've heard about them. And yeah. when Andrei Sakharov, know, of course. Uh, sure, yeah. of course, of course. It, it yeah. came in a little bit later, and it was a figure of, of absolute impossible to understand how we can resist the regime. The regime is so powerful. The regime can, you know 
do whatever they want with you. You cannot even squeak, and mm-hmm. suddenly, boom, there's a figure, there's a person who talks pretty openly. Mm-hmm. But, but my heroes were, uh, li- like always, when you don't know someone, uh, you admire him, but when you know someone who is like you, who is here, who is near you, and suddenly he says to himself probably, Stop, I'm stop, I, I stopped lying, I cannot shut my mouth, this is it, this is, this is my line. So I knew several people like that. Ah, okay. Their, their names are unknown here. A couple of them took part in the stupid attempt to steal a plane, airplane from St. Petersburg Airport. A couple, you know, just were dissidents, a couple were refuseniks. So I, I, I knew this circle because I wasn't, you started with question about books. It's mm-hmm. one of the most unusual things that happened in my life is that in the Soviet Union at that time, so much was forbidden that we, we developed channels by which books and pamphlets and all this information traveled. I would receive calls from a friend of mine who would say in the code, because we were afraid the telephones, you know, KGB may be listening to our conversations, which is totally probably stupid because no one, who, need, who needed me? But... Anyhow, who would say in, in, in code word that he has something interesting. We would meet at a certain point. He would give me a package. In the package was a book. That wow. Was a book or typed book. You know, we, we didn't have any, any copy machines at that time. Was this, could, could, could this have been considered Samizdat? Yeah, yeah. Samizdat. So the underground literature, correct? Yeah, underground literature. And you uh, were taking a big risk by, with your hands on this, am I correct? Yes. Uh, uh, but people who would start it, who would type, because it was usually t- somebody was sitting day and night and taping, t- typing yeah. them. And in, in, in the old machines, you can do only four copies maximum. The fourth copy was terrible. But anyhow, we, we, we would receive that. We would go home. We would read the whole night because wow. the next day you would have to give it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you would call to your friend, a trusted friend, that you know that, that will not tell, you know, uh, although when someone is caught, he usually would blur up everything that he does. Yeah, but, and so that that's very scary because of the of the rats and the stool pigeons yeah, and the yeah. informants. Uh, you must have been very paranoid growing up in terms of who I you think spoke that to, all, right? We all had uh, schizophrenia uh, because uh, it's impossible at age six or seven to know what to tell and not what to tell, to tell yeah. one thing at home, another thing at school, and not to feel like yeah. you're lying. Now, Leon Weinstein, I, you know, I ask some questions sometimes that perhaps are not asked, but you know, they're spoken of and, and, and so much part of um, you know, that we know of the tradition and different things. So I, I want to ask a few questions. That, For instance, you, you grew up in a, in a Jewish household, am I correct? Correct. Now, would you say, was most of your thoughts and thinking and community and, and let's say, anti-Soviet thinking, did this just include the, the Jewish community, or did this also include some Russian free, free thinkers and, and some Russian people? Like, was there an inner involvement, or it was basically, uh, you would say, a, a, was it mainly a Jewish community? No, I think it was it was all over. Jews were a little bit more prosecuted, not a little mm. bit more prosecuted. So probably the the inner resistance was even higher than than um, at other circles. But no, no, right. I, 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 I we interacted with all the circles. Uh, I worked uh, at that time at the Leningrad Film Studios, Len Film, mm-hmm. which is one of the main uh, film studios in the Soviet Union was, and uh, you know ninety percent of my friends and people whom I worked were were not Jews. Uh, Ukrainians, Russians, ex-Germans, and so on and so on. Who so, also shared anti-Soviet absolutely, thinking. Absolutely. But now, Leon, you know, a lot of Jews had difficulty in Russia with anti-Semitism, not just from the persecution by the KGB, but, you know, the anti-Semitism that existed among Russians. Um, did you suffer from this? Did, did, did you suffer from, from Jew hatred uh, in, the, in the Soviet society? Uh, l- let me let me divide it into two different kind of questions. One question is so-called state anti-Semitism, which mm-hmm. yes, I did suffer uh, um, all my life. I knew when I was a child I will suffer. I knew that uh, only two percent of the students in the university can be Jewish, and so on and so on. Certain wait, wait, can are, you say that again? Only what? Uh, there. <laughs> 
Yes. There was actually a quota where yeah. only a certain percentage of students are allowed to be Jews. Correct. Two percent in the Leningrad universities. And what was the thinking behind this? Behind the thinking was the Soviets did not want to poison their institutions with Jewish blood? I have no idea. I mean, this sounds crazy because, uh, I mean, to uh, us it sounds yes. crazy. I'm just trying to think apart from anti-Semitism in general. In the, what, they just wanted to keep Jews to a minimum, even if Jews, let's say, were intelligent and had something to offer. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, again, it's, it's a total guess. I think that they didn't want to have all their scientists with a Jewish name. I see, I see. And, but, but, if, but if they allowed free competition, all the scientists probably would have Jewish names. Am I correct? Uh, you, know, you know what? Who knows? Who yes. knows? It was never attempted. Uh, no, but, no, I know. But, I'm just but, saying that so many yeah, Jews I, I, there I are intelligent and successful. Let, let right? me give you one, one more you know, thought for food for the, uh, yeah. thought for to, <laughs> my God to think about. Uh, practically every scientific organization had as a president or as as a director a person with a Russian name. I see. And his first deputy was 99.9% Jewish hmm. and probably another half percent Armenian. Hmm. What meaning do you find in this? Uh, those were people who were working and the face of, of the um, organization was supposed to be Russian. Okay, Leon, before we move on, okay, tell us a story of not state anti-Semitism but perhaps societal anti-Semitism where at a young age you realized that you were a target of hatred? Uh, my young brother, who is like five years younger than me, comes home uh, from kindergarten crying and saying, uh, those people tell me that I am Jew. And mom says, uh, what people? People in my kindergarten. So students, yes, boys, girls. And they're kind of hitting me and etc. So uh, she said, you know what, I'll tell you the truth. You are a Jew. And he cries and says, I don't want to be a Jew. I want to be a citizen of Leningrad. <laughs> and uh, I went through the same, same story. Practically everyone uh, in the city of, the great city of Leningrad, uh, went through the same thing. Uh, we were uh, beaten up. We were uh, pushed. We were told uh, practically on a daily basis. Uh, Leon, uh, I, you know, I, I regret, you know, asking, you know, very, very complicated questions and wanting simple, quick answers, but we have to move forward. If you were to answer briefly at the best way you could, why so much anti-Semitism in Russian culture and society? Ah, uh, the simple answer is I don't know. I mean, it didn't just start with the Soviet regime, correct? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it right. started many, many years ago. Uh, I believe that anti-Semitism was was because people were afraid of anything that was foreign, mm -hmm. looked like different from theirs. Uh, and also, all, always the governments used uh, foreign groups, and the Jew, Jews are very, very good target uh, for hate, to explain why uh, you, uh, good citizens of our country, don't have something because of them. Right, and the Soviet regime obviously fueled the anti-Semitism because it was extremely anti-Semitic. Uh, it was um, very much. Uh, now, Leon, um, let's tie this into North Korea for a minute because we want to go to the callers because, by the way, the interview I did with you at Front Page uh, got a huge reaction. You, also, you were also a tremendous uh, star the other day on my show, The Glazoff Gang. Uh, just a sec, I'm going to just check with the audience that, that we have an audience here. Audience, what did you think of Leon Weinstein's performance on The Glazoff Gang the other day? Okay, so we can see Leon. It was a great performance, and um, I recommend everybody to watch the Glass Off this this week's edition of the Glass Off Gang on the Invented People. Because uh, Leon Weinstein, did you enjoy your um, performance on there? And the, the, I enjoyed the tremendous, I enjoyed tremendously the company that you put together. <laughs> okay, so let's let's get to North Korea one more time before we go to the callers. 
Uh, Leon, so in terms of this totalitarian mindset, one more time, and so I'll, I'll go back for our listeners just for a second. What a story by my mother that when Stalin died, she was weeping as a little girl, her mother was weeping as a little girl, but her grandmom was celebrating and ripping up Stalin's picture and throwing them into the toilet. Now, the key here is that the mother, my mom's mom, was saying while she was weeping, was actually saying to her mother, don't do this, you'll get us all arrested. So this is very, very intriguing because on the one hand you're weeping and yet you know that you will be punished by a tyrant for freedom of action and thought. So there's kind of a, a, a multi-personality schizophrenia involved. That's exactly what I was telling you. Yeah. You, you. You nailed it 100%, but let me mm -hmm. tell you something. The okay. tyrant so, is so just to finish that question, when we Sorry. see the North Koreans sobbing in that way, on the one hand truly truly depressed, and, but at the same time terrified, right? Go ahead. Uh, I think that part of them is depressed because they don't know what will happen. The kind of skies are falling on them. On the other side, they're happy because there's a glimmer of hope. There. Not that that uh, the the son Kim Jong Un, I believe his name, uh, it proved to be better, but it's just a glimmer of hope because the previous one, the dead one, the Kim Jong Il, was a terrible person, a tyrant and a terrible mm -hmm. person. So tyrant is dead, and of this tyrant, we will see what future will bring us. Uh, Leon, what do you think? Quickly before we go to the phones. What's this uh, young young son? I mean, he looks, uh, I mean, do we have any hope that he would, you know, I think it's almost ridiculous and absurd to suggest that he might be some kind of a liberal or a, a no. Gorbachev or a Khrushchev figure? No, of course he is not Gorbachev. But if, if, if you will recall, after Stalin, we didn't have any Gorbachev. It took another, you know, 20 yeah. years. So, but it can start happening because the groups within the government will start eating each other, will try to, you know, usurp power. Some will play on more military and more, you know, difficult stunts mm -hmm. against the United States and the world, and some will play something different. So we will see the dynamic. I don't know if this guy will survive or not. I frankly I don't give uh, anything right. to about him. He's the third in a terrible line and, you know, don't want to wish bad ill to anyone, but, but I don't want him to, to be a tyrant and rule this country. So there is a hope that something will come out of that. Yeah. I would advise our government to bring any, you know, ships there and start exercising or doing anything because it will help the bad people within the Korean government. So let's hope that they will start eating each other uh, and, and something will come out of that. Leon, very quickly, just to uh, pick your very wise brain for a second, um, you know, also out of my own interest because of my own Russian background, my parents were dissidents in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, I find that you a fascinating individual. Uh, Leon, um, in terms of literature, in terms of Russian literature, very, brief, very quick brief answers here, if you don't mind, what is uh, one or two pieces of Russian literature that were uh, very inspirational to you that you loved? Uh, I loved Dostoevsky, practically everything that I read. Mm -hmm. not, Brothers Karamazov, not, Capital Brothers Punishment. Brothers Karamazov, yeah. uh, Idiot, and, and you know, mm -hmm. all others. Uh, I, I loved Tolstoy. I'm sorry, I'm giving you the names that probably everyone will give. I yeah. love Pushkin. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the best uh, Russian poets. And, uh, Pavel Bulgakov, Maldestan. Bulgakov is, is my idol. I mm -hmm. even try to stay in stage, um, you know, one of his books to write a play and to stage it. Mm -hmm. um, How about your thoughts on some dissidents, uh, Alexander Ginsburg, Vladimir Bukovsky, Sharansky? Who meant a lot to you that you admired? Uh, Vainovich and Sharansky. Vainovich and Sharansky. Um, very quickly, we know that the Russian people surprisingly are rising up against Putin today, almost out of the blue. What do you think about this movement? It was, I mean, Putin for a minute thought that he was going to be the tyrant that lasts forever. It appears that he's not really that supported anymore. It's taking me aback, too. I don't know what, what to say about that. What's mm -hmm. surprising is a lot of people who we thought 
would never voice their opinion suddenly uh, suddenly they're on on this side on the side of the opposition and a couple of people in particular uh, the signals me that something is shifting because those people would never risk their future would never risk their uh, careers if they wouldn't smell uh, that air may be burning for for Putin uh, for example there is a you know was was a very famous person who died mayor of St Petersburg Anatoly Sobchak he was a friend of mine and his mm-hmm. daughter become a known TV personality there and she's kind of an opportunist so mm-hmm. I saw a couple of days ago she's t- she taking part in those demonstrations, and I said to myself, uh-oh, meaning it's all very serious right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are going to go to the phone lines. You are such a popular man, Leon Weinstein. Our phone lines are lining up here. The number is 347-857-1380. On the Jamie Glazoff Show, our guest is Leon Weinstein. Let's go to... Mark, from Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, Jamie, thank you for uh, taking my call. Go ahead, Mark. I'm I'm very um, interested, Mr. Weinstein, your uh, your interview with uh, Jamie on Front Page, when I first read it, was just so exciting uh, to me and, and so inspirational because you're saying things in such clear unequivocal terms that even people in this country who consider themselves to be conservatives are too timid to say. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering <laughs> what your your take is on this. Why do you think it is that in this country which in which you extol uh, its virtues so well, uh, why it is that people have become uh, so many people have become complacent and corrupted by this this ideal or, or this uh, chimera of, of socialism. Mark, before uh, we go further, name one or two things that you were impressed with, uh, let's just say Leon calling a spade a spade. Yeah, yeah, that that was one one example. But, I mean, when you say things, Leon, like, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that, individual rights and and capitalism are uh, uh, inextricably linked that there is no compromise between uh you know between free market and social socialism uh that that people who 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 want to live or choose to live under a socialist system are essentially slaves these are things that are considered very extreme among circles even you know conservative circles in this yeah. country and I, I find it refreshing that you are so okay. vocal about that uh-huh. Leon yeah. uh, go ahead you're, you're go? braver <laughs> you're, number one tell us why you're so brave number two what do you think about how pathetic our culture has become in terms of the fear of what Mark said of even you know saying the truth Mark can I call you Mark yeah uh, absolutely okay. Thank you for a very good question. And yes, there is. It is a two-part question. Let me answer first part. Uh, when my when when my grandfather was young, uh, he came to Saint Petersburg in 1916 as a very young attorney from Ukraine, and he began to work with, for another attorney as an assistant. And in 1917, like six months after he came there. Uh, he comes to his mentor and says there is drunk sailors uh, and and some some deserters from the front running around the city and firing you know what what to do maybe we should go out of the city and the guy very wise attorney told him don't worry about that three days later no one will hear about them he was very wrong uh, they didn't resist no one resisted because no one knew that it will be for 72 years so I don't want to repeat uh what my grandfather and his friends and his generation did they didn't know we know already i went through that i was born into that i know how terrible it is i know what does it mean to be to the equality the the redistribution of wealth the wonderful things that people tell us why wouldn't you give a little bit to this child i would give a little bit to this child but don't force me to do that so i feel 
I feel that I obligated to talk. And since I'm not a politician, not running to an office, not, 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 you know, I'm again 62 years old. My career is not at stake. I'm an independent businessman. So I can say things as I see them. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. But I, I say whatever I see and whatever I feel the danger. And I feel the danger with my skin. I began to feel it in 2008. And, and I felt obligated to begin to write letters, circulate them on the Internet, start my own blog, start my own site. Uh, you know, I have about... Leon, yeah. uh, sorry for interrupting, um, yeah. but let, let me ask this, because, you know, my family, like yours, because coming from a totalitarian environment, we can also smell it when it's around. You are basically saying that, you know, Barack Obama and his administration, you can smell what actually created the Soviet empire, Correct. Absolutely. That's that's the problem. But you know, when I begin to think about about it, and Mark, this is the answer to the second part of your question. When I begin to think and examine, I suddenly realize that the wonderful system that was created about two hundred years ago by the founding fathers has flaws. And we see that something is wrong with the Western democracy and the way that we govern ourselves or our, our society, because it allows, in, in the situations where the financial crisis or any other military crisis or whatever, it allows a group of opportunists to take over the country. So the democracies are not working as planned. It's not working because, as I said, it's flawed. And, and in other words, when more than half of the waters receive financial assistance from the state without contributing to the mutual basket, the democracy fails. Because at this point, it will not be able to stop or even reduce entitlement programs and will start morphing into a nanny state and eventually trans will be transformed into a tyranny. Mm -hmm. can be tyranny of the left, of the majority. Leon, is this, yeah. is this actually real? Like a lot of people would say that you're paranoid, this would never happen. In terms of what you see actually progressing in the United States under Obama, do you think that there's actually a chance that socialist tyranny could emerge in the United States? Uh, absolutely, yes. But, you, you, you know, I developed, I thought about that a lot. Uh, by trade, I'm a theater director and a playwright. And all my life, I worked for children. So my goal was to write a play and stage a show the way that children will understand. I had an, an educational theater of Tel Aviv for many years. I actually created it and then was an artistic director of this organization. So uh, uh, I, I kind of learned, after years of experience, how to explain complicated things to people, to children in this case, in a simple way. Mm -hmm. And when you break it down, when you simplify it, will break it down to something very, very simple, people start suddenly understand what you're talking about. Because, mm -hmm. you know what, we can go into a long discussion with 25, you know, liberal Democrats, and I was... I, I would tell them, it will go, it might, might go, and they will say, you're crazy, we have Internet, we have something else, America will never be a socialist country, etc., etc. But when you, I can give you one or two examples of what I mean by real simplification. So people wait, wait, want, Leon, yeah. I, I want you to hold on to those examples. <laughs> Um, and by the way, I just want to say what a fascinating book you've written because that's exactly what you've done. You've, you, you make your anecdotes very, very simple, and yet they're extremely profound. Um, we're going to get to that, but we've got to take another caller. Stephen Brown from the Great White North, Canada. Are you there? Yes, I am, Jamie. You were able to call despite uh, the, uh, what, what you guys live in, igloos up there? Or what, what yeah, Canada yeah, like? I just uh, fought off a polar bear and... Uh... And uh, got okay, on my but sled, and use, uh, the sled dog got some... me the nearest telephone booth. But you, but but there is some technology. I just had to talk to Leon. Uh, okay, so Stephen Brown is the contributing editor of Front Page Magazine, and also a great fan of Leon Weinstein. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Leon, I just wondering. I'm just curious. Uh, you said earlier on that you began to see through the Soviet system when you were in your late teens. Was it any one event or any one book you read that uh, opened your eyes? Or uh, I'm just curious of, of uh, how all of a sudden you just uh, began to realize the truth. 
Uh, no, in, in my in my case, it was uh, summation additions of you know layer upon layer. Because as I said earlier, I had a grandfather uh, who was teaching me to to think independently. It's it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, and I'm not joking. It is. And uh, uh, what what happened is uh, the sum of knowledge. For example, we all knew that without being member of Young Communist League, Komsomol it was called, you cannot be accepted into a university. So what do you do? You go and apply. When you apply, you have to, to tell a story to your uh, you know, peers who are already members of the Komsomol, why you want to apply, and you tell them, I want to be the, the, to be the builder of communism. Now, just ten people that are sitting there and supposed to vote and say, yes, accept you or not, they're your friends, and they know that you could care less about communism and don't want to build anything, because two months earlier, they went to the same stupid procedure, and they also hate communism, but they ten of them sit and listen to you very seriously, and you give your speech, and then they say to each other, so what do you think, comrades, about Leon Weinstein? Yes, he will be a very good young communist, you know, something, and they vote. After they vote, you go to them to get together to play soccer, and you say, sorry, sorry, bad word, communists, we hate them, we don't want to live here, it would be a great idea to escape from here, go to America. You know, it's totally crazy. Well, my second question is this, you, with your vast experience of Soviet totalitarianism and uh, totalitarian socialism, where do you see it as most prominent in the United States, this same mindset? I mean, not so much the actions, but the mindset. Is it the universities? I mean, let's forget the Occupy Wall Street movement. We already know it's, you know, uh, yeah, soldiers went, there. Where, yeah, do, you, where went, do you see it? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I went to Occupy and with a, with, with a video camera with a couple of friends, and we did a 15-minute show about Occupy. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, uh, the, the only word that I can say you know, the, for the reason why they're there is because uh, they envy people who have. Uh, now, the places where we're mostly... Uh, so-called liberal dash progressive dash socialistic mindset is number one Hollywood, number two media, number three universities, and you know what? It's a great success for socialists. For last probably 20 or 30 years, they were working hard in order to bring up a new generations of Americans, totally brainless, who cannot examine anything critically, who have trigger words, the moment that they hear a trigger word, they start jumping and yelling something like... Like, like the Pavlov's or, dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, Pavlov's you want to jump in here? Yeah, uh, I, a friend of mine is a great-grandson of Pavlov. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, do you want to jump in here? Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here, Jeremy. Uh, yes, I, I I hear what uh, what Leon is saying, and it, I mean it's it's so true. Even I mean, to someone who's grown up in this culture, to see this, having read you know Ayn Rand and uh, and the uh, Austrian Economist, I mean, you see these fallacies that people just accept as if they are you know they're givens, and and they never examine why why they believe these things and when you challenge them they're they're very resistant and uh it, i mean i it, it's interesting that you you pick up on that uh but i mean why do you think that uh we are so easily persuaded because, or some because, of us are because the right of vote of voting supposed to be earned, not given to everyone who never contributed anything. Uh, you know, one one of the stories, or not stories, uh, 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 simplifications I wanted to give you would go uh, the following way: one person work, second doesn't work. They live on an island. Two of them. Do you think that two, both of them supposed to have? equal what in decision regarding what to do with the money that they first earned. Right. That's, a, that's an excellent example. Uh, yeah. But again, this is something that's not, I mean, certainly not taught in, in most of our schools. Or, or, or for example, 
uh, one person, uh, two people live on an island. You, know, you see, when you simplify, it's not 240 million or 300 billion dollars. It's two people live on an island. Very easy. One of them works, brings money home, builds a home, builds a garden, has a pool, needs someone to take care of all these things. Comes to the second one and says, you're not working. Maybe you will take care of my pool. The other says, no, thank you very much. I don't want to do it because, you know, it's, it, the pay is not good. So you see, the first guy forced to bring from outside of the island, dash country, uh, someone to help him and pays him the, 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 uh, for, for the manual labor that he performs. Now, the question is, does the rich guy have to pay unemployment to the, for the other one? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. If, that... if you answer no, why 11 million immigrants, so-called illegal immigrants, found a job here or jobs here, and 11 million Americans sitting on unemployment doing nothing. Right, right. So it's totally crazy. 11 million immigrants who do not speak English, who have no idea about our laws, who don't know how to drive, come here and find jobs, and 11 million Americans who were educated in the great American public school system cannot find jobs. Right, and, and, and do you not find it tragic Leon, that that uh, these these stories have been repeated over and over again throughout history, and yet we seem to, to to be repeating the same mistake. People seem to be forgetting over and over again the the tragic consequences of this. Uh, you know, people, strange thing, but but uh, people probably do not know how to learn because. Uh, they maybe know history, but they don't understand history. They do not examine it. There is no critical thinking. Uh, uh, let, let me give you another, another short, if I may, example from my book, because everything that I'm telling you right now is in the book, uh, in Capitalism 101, I mean. Uh, you know, two, two brothers received an inheritance, $100 million each. One of the brothers was great, altruistic, fantastic, Democrat, liberal, you know, who decided to give the money away because this money earned by his father on the, on the you know, uh, blood and, and tears of poor people. So he found uh, addresses of 10,000 poor people, and one day 10,000 people received each one a check of $1,000. They were so happy, celebrated, one bought a TV, another made new teeth, another you know, drank himself to death, etc., etc. So for two weeks, he made them happy. And the Time magazine wrote about him a story, the man of the year. The other brother was totally different. He decided to invest the money. He didn't give any single penny to anyone. He employed 10,000 people, and for 30 years, the thir the, those people received good salary, sent their children to, for good education, uh, bought cars, went to, you know, to vacations, etc., etc. He was heralded as the worst man of the century. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's in your opinion? Who of them the hero of the land? The one that spent $100 million in order to send them um, this money to $1,000 to, to each that will enjoy two weeks, or the one that built industry that employed the same 10,000 people, maybe the same people? Well, give us your answer, Leon. <laughs> I'm for capitalism. Right. I think that more, more business we do, more more we create the creators of of everything new are business people the entrepreneurs people who do not sleep nights do not you know go to sleep think about their business wake up think about their business run work 23 hours a day and then finally 2% of them succeed they mm -hmm. have a huge amount of failure but they are heroes because because of them because mm -hmm. of them because of their greed because of, of their desire to do good to themselves and to their families, roads are built. And, um, Leon, and I ha absolutely. I have so, a couple more questions for you, but I, I want Steve to get a chance to jump in uh, one more time. Sorry. Steve, are you there? Okay, you want, you yeah, to... uh, Leon. You know, Abraham Lincoln said one time, America will never be destroyed from the outside. Uh, if America falters and loses its freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. So... 
I just want to ask you, where do you think the greatest danger to American freedoms lie, to the lifeblood of the United States, you know, United States' existence as it is now? I believe, number one, I already said, the right of vote given to everyone without earning it. Number two, the right Wait, of wait, what do you mean by that? Can, can you expand on that? What yes, do you they, mean that there has to be – what do you mean the right to, to vote by earning it? I, I mean that if you are turning 18, have no idea about life, didn't give to the state anything, suddenly you can decide what to do with the money that other people's made. Mm -hmm. Meaning that you can vote for what? For to go to war or not to go to war? Meaning Wait, that your, your personal stance is that there should be a certain, that people should have to work or be educated in some way to vote? I do not want to right now speculate on how they're supposed to earn it. There are many different ways. But, but you believe in reciprocal rights and obligations, that there can't just be voting. Absolutely. You mean if I, if I, yeah, if a human being doesn't contribute to the society in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. There are I a see. number okay, of different forward. ways. That's okay, number so one. Forward. Yeah. Number two, there is a, a right given by, uh, I believe, 15th Amendment to the government, to the, to the uh, uh, Congress, to take as much money as they want from us. Uh, the right to take income tax shall, shall be abolished from both, uh, you know, individuals and corporations. Wait, you're against any taxes? I against income taxes. Okay, so the do money made. Punish, do not mm -hmm. punish my success. Mm -hmm. You cannot take money. You know, it's so crazy. Uh, I lived hundred. 50 years, I worked all my life. Uh, I, I, I'm paying half of what I earned uh, in order to what, sustain several uh, uh, programs uh, that gov government decided are important. I'm not talking about right now military, because government is supposed to protect and serve. There's a lot of things inside of the simple words, but they are not supposed to take our money, loan them, or give them yeah. to, to companies, or decide you know, what programs to run, etc., etc. Yeah, Leon, are you by a computer? I sent you an email that I'd like to discuss with you for a minute, if you can take a look at the computer. Absolutely. Okay, while we do that, I want to build on something that both Steve and Mark have touched on in their own way, uh, just to show how backward our culture and society has become in terms of being afraid to actually just tell the truth. I was even, I even cringed for a minute when I read a part of your book, but it was so true. I, I'm not saying I cringed because of my own beliefs, but I could just imagine how our society would take this. You believe that young children should actually be taught capitalistic values in terms of making money, making interest, um, that they should just be actually coached on how to make money and how to make interest off money. And th so many people would be appalled by this, that, oh, my God, why would you be teaching greed to kids? But if one system is actually the most successful society in the world, why not teach children how to engage in it and, and build prosperity, correct? God forbid I am not saying we need to brainwash anyone. Right. But to teach them how to survive in the world and to teach mm -hmm. them the ropes of the society and to give them possibility to to choose what they want, absolutely. But that's a and great part of your book. Tell our, our uh, listeners quickly what you believe that kids should actually be taught in terms of capitalism at a young age. As, as a matter of fact, I began to look at your email and this email suddenly burst into music. Oh, okay, so sorry. That's what, that's what we heard. Oh, okay, no problem. Just, just yeah, uh, press, press stop on it. But be, uh, before I get to that, tell our listeners what you think children should be taught in terms of capitalism. Uh, I think that every person, every child in the United States of America should be explained uh, how capitalism works, that uh, we, we – if, if one person earns money and he spends all this money, he will not be able to invest the money. Mm -hmm. so this is one of the things that people need to understand, that only those who have excess of money, they can then 
do mm. something with them, build the business, put together several people like that, yeah. invest in the business, try to, and then from that comes employment of others. Uh, Leon, let's move on quickly now. Do you see the title of the video I sent you? Yes. Can you say it in Russian? Nash Durdom Galasuyetaputina. Yeah. Can you translate that in English for our viewers? Ah, uh, ah, uh, our uh, crazy, uh, crazy people vote for Putin. Right now, this our my, crazy, my yeah. and and who is that? Rab uh, Rab Fak Rab Shak on the left side. Rab that is those are yeah. that's the singer. Well, how do you pronounce that? No, 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 it's not a singer. It's not, uh, I believe, singer's name, oh, although I don't know. Uh, but I see. Okay, but that, but this new uh, song, uh, say it one more time, it's our, our mental hospital is voting for Putin? Correct. Now this, have you heard of this yet, uh, Leon? No, no. Now this is, you know, my mother's very excited. This is a fascinating, great new video out by Brave Russians and by a brave new Russian group. Uh, that's no. making fun of Putin. Right. And, maybe, maybe, and, maybe it's a group. Maybe it's a group because for the person's name, it doesn't work. It doesn't sound. But maybe it's a group. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe uh, you know, I, I encourage you to watch it. On, and I'm, we're telling all our listeners as well that there's this new video. The translation is our mental hospital that's voting the, uh, for Putin, and it's a satire on Putin. Uh, great new video. It's out in YouTube. And, uh, Leon, why I'm bringing it up is that, uh, to get back to it, because we're discussing totalitarianism, the Soviet regime, Putin was, you know, the KGB, but now all of a sudden we're seeing these music videos, we're seeing the Russian people on the streets. Are you inspired by what's happening? Very much so, very much so. I, what do you think I, is happening? Why is there all of a sudden this turn? I think that what happened during the last elections... Uh, was the last straw. I think that uh, those people uh, uh, and the technology helped to organize all that because when you sit at home in your own kitchen, you don't know what other people are thinking or, or, or saying. You think you're alone, but if you can exchange ideas via Internet or phones or messaging or whatever, you suddenly realize there are many of us. So people realize that there are many of them and went to the streets. Leon, do you think that Putin's days are numbered? Uh, no, not yet. So we're not, we, you know, we shouldn't perhaps be too optimistic yet, but there's some, there's some big protests coming up. Am I correct? Uh, yes, I believe a number of them. And what's very important is that one of the most outspoken oligarchs, very uh, head of person with several billion dollars, uh, who said that he will be running in the next uh, presidential elections against Putin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and this is so, important, uh, meaning, meaning that a group of people with real money, with a lot of money, uh, will be trying to overthrow the regime. Do you ever think about going back to Russia and maybe running for president? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, mm, uh, I don't want to be a president. I want to be a critic of a president. <laughs> but, do you, but do you hope and do you wish for freedom in Russia, or have you... Or uh, wash your hands of Russia oh, and and and, be, and become pardon. Look, it's a, it's a great country. It's a great 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 people, great culture, uh, mm -hmm. won wonderful cities. Uh, you know, the history wasn't really uh, uh, really very easy on them. Uh, history in, throughout the last couple of thousands of years was very very hard on Russians. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish them I wish them a best of luck. Leon, there's also quite an election coming up in a country called the United States of America, and there are people like Mark and Steve, and I think you and I, that are very worried if Barack Obama gets in one more time. Are you frightened and pessimistic if Obama gets in for one more term? No, I, I hope it will not happen. I, I, uh, I cannot understand how people you know, can, uh, can vote for him after what he did or what he didn't do, I think that, that his three years were very destructive. I, uh, I cannot even imagine how destructive he can be if he will be another four years in the office. He might harm the United States. 
you know, so much that it will be very difficult to reverse. Yeah, yeah you think it might be irreversible if he Correct. gets in one more time in terms of everything. We Correct. have a few minutes left. I'd like, I'd like Steve and Mark uh, to get in one more time. Mark, some um, final concluding thoughts from you or maybe one more question, whatever you'd like to say. Well, yes, Leon, you made a statement uh, in your in your interview with uh, Jamie that I found really profound and, and quite beautiful in its insight. I, I want to quote here just very quickly. When I came back almost 20 years after my emigration, I suddenly understood why God didn't allow Jews who were born slaves to enter the promised land. The tribes were circling deserts for 40 years, and only after the last slave died did their journey come to an end. I'm wondering if you can just uh, expand upon that a little bit and explain what you meant by that. When I came back to Russia, it was like probably 18, 19 years after I emigrated. And uh, at that time, uh, my friends, my age, were very much against uh, the, the government, the Communist Party, you know, everything that had to do with that. And I came back, uh, we were all grown up men, and... Uh, suddenly I saw that their uh, philosophy, their, their, uh, uh, their life changed them so much that they no, were explaining to me why, uh, for example, police uh, takes bribes in Russia. You know, they were not outraged by that. They were telling me, oh, but, but police, you know, in our country, they're receiving so small salary that they have to do it. So uh, I thought to myself, uh, the, the, those those people are uh, already part of of this society that was uh, was was growing slaves. Uh, the, the relations between people in Russia, and I, I frequently came there because I was doing some business and was helping uh, to establish relations between uh, Saint Petersburg and and, uh, and and Los Angeles, and was helping in some other stuff. Uh, in Moscow, I met with mayors of both cities, met, as a matter of fact, several times with, with Vladimir Putin. Uh, what, what I saw is that when... Uh, quickly, Ru please, Leon. Right. R when Russians uh, see person who is in their perception lower than they are, they kind of yell at him, they, they talk to him like he's, he's, he's a slave. But the moment that is someone who they, they perceive as higher than they are, they change completely and start, you know, talking like, like he is the God who, who right now will give them something. Yeah, we see that, yeah. uh, like, there's a, a deep pathology in, in, in the Russian society, uh, mainly because of communism, I would argue. Stephen, your final thoughts in 10 seconds, and if you have a question or a final thought. Yeah, I just have another question for Leon. I just want to go back to that comment you made that if Obama gets another term, he will probably just have one minute left. Go ahead, Steve. Irreparable damage to the United States. What do you see him doing that he hasn't done so far to the damage to the United States economically? Very briefly, uh, please, Leon. M more EPA uh, regulations, uh, more, uh, more power to the unions, uh, more money uh, coming out of the pockets of the government, our pockets, and uh, flowing to the companies that they decide uh, they, they want to, to uh, foster. And uh, I, I am afraid that he will make 51% of this country dependent on the state. Thank you. Uh, just uh, in a few seconds we have left, Leon, if you have a talent of five to ten second answer, three more questions before we're going to go. <laughs> I think that Putin is a very evil man. In 10, 15 seconds, you tell us, who is this guy? This guy is a KGB mafia. He's an ex-KGB. He's a colonel. He was the head of the KGB uh, station in Germany. Then he came back to St. Petersburg, where he's from. At age 15, as a matter of fact, he went to the KGB and offered his services to uh, spy on his classmates. Yeah, so, so this uh, is... He, yeah, nice person. Nice man. He, he's, he's a stool pigeon in the end, right? Yep. Um, yep. And, and a KGB man. Um, Stephen, Mark, thank you very much for your profound wisdom that you offered to the show. Thank you for calling in. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Leon, thank you. Leon Weinstein, what an honor and a privilege to have you here. We advise all of our listeners to get Leon's great book, Capitalism 101, which shows and explains why capitalism is such a success. Leon, you will come back on our program? With great pleasure.
Thank you very much, Leon. And Daniel Ashton, are you there? Daniel is behind the scenes. And um, we will... I'm here, Jamie. Daniel, we need, a quick five, uh, we need a quick five-second update from you on how your dog Yoshi is doing from the fight that he was in. He will probably get his staples removed this week, and he's doing very well. Thank you for the kind words, Jamie. Fantastic. We'll see you next week, everybody. Thank you.